Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, my name is Danny Sanchez. I'm very excited to be here with you on the latest session of Trading 8. Um, golly, so my guest today, some of you will recognize him pretty immediately, um, but he is an incredible educator, a wonderful performer. He is recognized around the world. Um, numerous awards uh, from a teaching perspective, from a performance uh, perspective. We've seen him drumming on a mountain in the rain. Um, <laughs> It's really a pleasure to have Mr. Todd Sukerman here. Thank man, you. Thanks thank for you me, for man. taking the time. I truly appreciate right. it. I just went through a clinic here with um, Todd and uh, master class. Was, master class. I, I always try to make a big distinction between well a, a clinic and a master class. Okay, so this was the master class format. Correct. Yeah, and it was great. Yeah, where a clinic is part performance, part education. Yes, sir. This is a small group, uh, three-hour instructional. Uh, personal instructional event. And it was awesome. Thank if you, you. any of you out there get the opportunity to participate, please do it. Go to ToddSugarman.com, figure all that out as quick as you can because it's a Figure out how experience. to get to ToddSugarman.com? Yes. Okay. Figure so all that out. -E <laughs> Perfect. Now we got it. I need a cue card so everybody else can see it. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah, man, I'm just going to ask you a few questions and um, we'll just kind of see where we go from there. All right. We're going to trade H, I guess. Yes, we are. I never seem to. Get to all eight. But, okay, so if you go to your website, there's a lot of great interviews for, uh, that take you to your YouTube page about how you, um, we were performing really early, at an early age, and you had obviously music in your family. One of the questions I like to ask is like, that, that seemed to be something that you were already interested in, but was there a catalyst moment that said, you know what? Music is going to be my career, or it just was. It just happened. No, it, it just was. I mean, I, I was so fortunate to be the youngest in a musical family, so that was just what I was literally brought up into. Is there was always music uh, happening, um, and as I got older, there's you know there's a stereo in every bedroom, so there'd be you know Count Basie coming from one room mm -hmm. and Led Zeppelin coming from another room, or you know it just all different kinds of music. Classical, um, Chicago 2 was a record that my mother brought home when I was a baby and, and I, I would sit with my own Mickey Mouse record player and diapers playing that record over and over again and just sitting there uh, mesmerized. My father was a drummer so mm -hmm. there was a drum set in the house. My, old, my oldest brother Paul who was seven years older than I was was already playing piano by the time I was born. So it was a, I mean, it was a wonderful card to be dealt in life to, to be the youngest in a musical family where there's always something to talk about, always something to, to check out. So that was just the way of life and that continued. It's the know. next step is on. Yeah, I, 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 I never, as a matter of fact, uh, one night, I, I tell this story a lot, um, you know, I went to Berkeley uh, in Boston for one year and one night it dawned on me that most people here did not have the path that I had where I knew I was always going to do this, I never wanted to be uh, a fireman or an astronaut or whatever, like I always was going to do this. And I realized that everyone around me had to have that, that moment where they, they decided, I think I want to be a trumpet player, I think I want to be a saxophone player, or a guitarist, or a bassist, or whatever, you know. And after many uh, adult beverages, I just I started going around the dorm room floor, just knocking on doors and saying, what was the moment that you decided mm. that you wanted to do this? And I found people's stories uh, very interesting because, you know, there'd be one guy that, you know, had a, a doctor and a lawyer for parents and they didn't want their kid to have a life in the arts and the, the strife and the struggles at home to get there. And, you mm -hmm. know, like I, I, I was bereft of that experience. So I was uh, very interested in everyone's stories of how they came to be here, this weird place in 1987. Um, at, at Berkeley and and try to become what they want to try to become because I, I never had to make that decision. It just always, it just always was. was. Yeah. That's wonderful. Wow. I, I it's it's good to hear that. I, I, I gone through a similar situation, I don't think to that degree, but it's like there never really was a question. It's just something that I wanted to do. And it's good to hear that. Well you it's good to hear that. you have to do it because you love it and the idea of doing anything else with your life is Preposterous, mm -hmm. and almost every musician that I know, that you know, when they stood at the precipice of their their high school years, or what were they going to do? Every one of them that took um, the college route and you know became a business major or something like that, that's where they went. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not one of them that like, oh, I'm a full-time musician, but I did that as a backup. Like it's, 
yeah, it's a sink or swim situation because it's it's not easy to do what we do, and it's not easy to be an artist and have to to live either, um, you know, was it hand to mouth or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. paycheck to paycheck, or, or you get to a point where, uh, or you're you know an actor, and you know you 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 go on a hundred auditions and you're told no a hundred times in a row, and you got to keep doing it, you know. It's, it's not easy, and there's no formula for success. There are certain things uh, that you could put together that could better your chances. Better your <laughs> chances, and I, I always talk about that at, um, at when I do drug clinics. Yes, sir. You know, always be on time. As a matter of fact, always be early. Show up prepared. You said yes to the job. You had to learn 30 songs. You learned 30 songs. You show up with the right tools for the job. Your drums, your cymbals, everything, they're the right choices and they're in perfect condition. Four, nail the job. You kill, you just put it in and you killed it. Number five, leave everybody happy that you were there. If you can put those five things together, not only drumming or you know, life in the arts, but anything, um, that, that's going to serve you very well and, and, and help propel you to where you ultimately would like to see your career going. That's wonderful. Thanks. Um, You, are, you just hit on those, but what do you feel like, um, other than what you said, which is a lot, what do you feel are your, the best qualities for a side man? Kind of just really established a lot. Well, yeah, yeah, there's that, but there's also, um, you have to be respectful that it's a gig. You, you said yes to the gig, and don't treat the gig like it's getting in the way of your social life. Don't get lost in your phone. Don't get lost in the computer. Don't make the band leader have to hunt you down in a parking lot, you know, uh, you know, after a 20 minute break, a 20 minute break is 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. It's not 22 minutes. You know, certain things like that. If, if, you, if you respect the job, respect yourself, don't act like the gig is beneath you, you know, which a lot of people do. A lot of people think that, yeah, I should be, you know, and the live audio mixers can be the same thing. They think that, like, they, they should be mixing Steely Dan, but they're, but they're mixing a wedding. Right. And they're pissed about it. Okay. You know, a, a gig's a gig. You know, if, if you if you said yes to it, then you should go into Plenty. that. Yeah, yeah. With, a, with 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 a smile. But yeah, don't 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 belittle anything, and um and, and play the music like it's the because a very important gig to you. I agree. Because every gig is yours to lose. True. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know. Don't lose the gig. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. Um. What are you listening to right now, outside of prep, I guess, for sticks? And uh, how are you listening to it? And when I say how, it's like, are you are you breaking out LPs? Are you go get the eight track still? Real, it's, real. It's funny. We just I, I have I, I still have all my old records, and those are in my studio. But I also have a bunch of new uh, 180 gram uh, LPs. But I don't have a record player. I was just talking about this with my wife last night that we we have to get that together because. It, it's more than just getting a, a, a record player. Everything's built in the wall, mm -hmm. so I have to have like drywall like, ripped oh, out. Okay. It's, like, it's a whole process that yes. I've avoided doing, but will do because I've been to a friend's house and heard, you know, what it is. Right. Now, I'm not going to pretend that I'm like some crazy audiophile, but like, are you looking at like a Macintosh with all that? No, no, it, it's uh, no. I, I think you can get like. A, Pretty kick-ass turntable for five, six hundred bucks. It's gonna, it's gonna do the, the, the trick, but yeah, no. I, I've got a five-year-old daughter, and the mm -hmm. bandmates pushing, they're pushing seventy. So I'm not, I'm not gonna be spending a nine thousand dollars on a turntable anytime soon. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. R right now, I'm actually uh, listening to different mixes from the Anton Fafard record that I just did, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to weigh in. On, on that with uh, the powers that be that are mixing the record at, uh, at the moment. Uh, I'm also gathering some material for something that I'm going to be looking at doing later in the year. Um, and I like, I like having a cocktail and getting on an airplane and putting my iPod on shuffle. And yes, I still use my iPod. Okay. Not the phone. Uh, not, not a phone, an actual iPod. An actual Dang. iPod. Yeah, because A, I don't want my phone battery. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have 160 <laughs> gig of, of music in an iPod. Right. 
Um, and it's, it's all right there. And then I could do stuff on the phone while I'm listening. And I know I get looks every now and then in a plane. Like, yeah, but it's, <laughs> What's it's, this guy doing? it's fantastic. I love putting it on shuffle and, and letting it surprise me. Okay. You know, sitting in there, you know, you can kind of get a little sleepy where they, they, they pressurize the cabin and the plane. <laughs> you got like one, that one pop in you, and then all of a sudden some song comes on that you haven't heard in a bunch of years. So and can you recall the last one that you heard on shuffle? Uh, uh, what did I just hear? Um, Yes, I, uh, um, a, a live, it's not a bootleg, it was a radio show of Genesis Live from the Philadelphia Spectrum in 83, It's Gotta Get Better. And Daryl Sturmer's guitar solo at the end of that was just killer. Like it, just, it, just, it took me to another place. Nice. Um, so yeah, that was, that was an experience I just had um, flying from Chicago to Denver awesome. just two weeks ago. If you can, if you get, yeah, you gotta look it I'll up. I'll find but, it. Yeah, it's, 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 like you were saying, everything is here. It's available. It's, it's, got, it's, got, it's got to be on YouTube. I mean, I, I recorded that off the radio on my Nakamichi cassette deck uh, when I was in uh, freshman year in high school. And then, wow. of course, you know, when Dats came out and made a Dat copy of that, <laughs> the Dat burned that to a CD, and then the CD was on, put to you know uh, M4A. Um, but yeah, that's cool. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, this is going to be, over the last year or two, um, wow, what is the most significant, you think, development in your musical growth? You've been playing at such a high level for a long time, recognized as doing that, but like if you sat back and asked yourself, like, what's been the thing that I feel like I really have took, taken that next step? And it could be, I don't, you know, I'm not going to put words in your mouth. Well, um, if you're lucky, you will have a lot of answers to this question. Um, I, I, can, I can give you two. Like when, I, when I discovered Steve Smith when I was nine years old, there was something about his playing that spoke to me on some level that I was different and I didn't understand. My brother came home with a Journey record, Evolution, which mm -hmm. is Steve Smith's first record that he did with him, 1979, and Smith was like 23, 24. Um, and I just knew intrinsically there's something going on here that is deeper than what meets the ear. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the benefits of growing up with brothers that are older than you that are musicians and then they have other musician friends that are older than them is then you all, you have this record pool, this knowledge in the pre-internet days, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden, like, oh, that guy you like from Journey, he played on this Jean Luc Ponty record, uh, 1977. Now, like, here, check it, I brought her over. Okay. Let's do that. And, mm -hmm. you know, that became my fusion Bible, and that really still is a monolith of fusion drumming, so I got something in my eyes driving me crazy. It, it, uh, it still holds up today, where there's some 70s fusion drumming that it's more like a historical piece. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, oh, that's the stuff that was happening then. But the drumming on there is still just shockingly beautiful and amazing. And whereas previously I would hear Billy Cobham or, or, or Lenny White with Return of Forever, and some of the, the ideas and concepts had eluded me. I wasn't clear what was happening. There was something about Steve's playing that was, it was like there were the Rosetta Stone or you know, the sun poking through the clouds and the angels going, ah, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden I could, I could hear articulations and sticking changes and I could hear what things were. And then I could go back and listen to Billy Cobham or Blenny White or Simon Phillips on the Jeff Beck there and back record and go, oh, that's what, what's happening. Mm -hmm. So that, was, that unlocked a lot of mysteries for me, it took me from a place where I was a, kind of a naturally a, a good player, but now I understand some complicated fusion drumming, and now mm -hmm. I'm able to, to, to get some of that into my vocabulary. Um, part two of, of your question would be uh, my one year at Berkeley, the experiences that I had there, the friends that I made, the, 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 the nights of sharing music with my friends, mm -hmm. Uh, and people in my dorm was very formative because now you had this pool of guys like, have you ever checked out this? Have you ever heard this guy? Da, da, da. And, and so now it's just all this information is coming at you. And then you're playing music with all these different 
players. And hey, the pianist is from Norway. You know, mm -hmm. he's got his thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like, okay. Um, mm -hmm. And then the teachers that I had, Skip Hayden, who really had a lot of unorthodox thinking outside of the box, esoteric ways of relating and understanding music. Uh, a lot of mental exercises that were really great. And then also he tightened up my reading. Ian Froman, he'd studied with, uh, with Elvin. So he came from this Elvin Jones, Jack DeJeanette place. Uh, and then studying privately with Gary Chafee, which was the, uh, kind of the antithesis of that. Um, where he had a, a, a direct formula in grids for like the fat backs, um, a whole sticking system, and his polyrhythmic thing was nuts, and then a whole linear side to his playing. So, you know, that, that is one of the benefits of a scenario like that, that you go to this giant open buffet and bar, and you get a big ass plate, and you know, it's like when you go to a buffet, like, oh, crab legs and Chinese and pancakes, okay? <laughs> and then you have this plate, and you're looking around the place, and, like, you're the only cat that has these things Everybody. on a plate. That's kind of what that experience was like for me. There were so many different um, things coming my way. Uh, and then after that, I worked the previous uh, five summers at a resort in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Two and a half hours north of Chicago, mm -hmm. and that's how I spent my summers from eighth grade through the time I went to Berkeley. Was playing oh, wow. six nights a week in a show band, dance band, variety show, blah blah blah. Old comedians, singers, jugglers, magicians, oh, wow. reading charts from the fifties. So these are you know some of these guys were like like the Caskills comedians, right you know. So I caught like the last bastion of that, that's and I played with horn players that were in their fifties. So if I'm messing up, you know, I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm getting one of those. Mm -hmm. So it was, that was the best education that I ever had. Now, after I went to Berkeley, I did not want to go back there because I wanted to go back to Chicago. I ran out of money. I was only going to Berkeley for one year. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go back and I wanted to work on all this stuff. And then I got the call. My brother was the musical director there. He goes, we really want you back this summer. And I said, well, I'll tell you what. So I gave some certain conditions that I wanted for me to go back there. Some of the conditions were I didn't want to live in the staff housing. I wanted my own hotel room. Yes, I want to eat in the dining room and order whatever I want off the menu, not eat in the staff dining room. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the nightclub is mine from nine to five every day. You know, that's mine to 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 just to practice. Shit. Yeah, because they would hold if it rains, they hold bingo or they do things, and they're like, nope, that's my room, nine to five. And did you get that? They said yes. So I said, I will see you tomorrow. And so I packed oh, up. Man. I packed up everything, drove up to uh, to Wisconsin. And that summer was not the summer of, of chasing girls and going to bars, which, you know, back in Wisconsin, you could go in there and, you know, a teenager going to the bar, like, well, I'll have them, you know, in Manhattan. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, those are the days, the right. fabulous 80s. Um, so I spent every day working on all these ideas that I couldn't possibly process uh, at Berkeley. Um, you know, had a boom box that had a recorder and, you know, in those days, and I would record my practice sessions, go back, get take a shower, get ready to go eat dinner, and listen to what I did that day. Uh, I'd go sit in the dining room by myself, order whatever I want, go back, get ready for the show, record the show all night, go back to my room. Right. So events in your like life it. led you to sticks not too much later, but so there's that one summer of that that you had? The, the, I, I spent six summers up there, but there's... The other five was. Right. I'm talking about that one summer. Was that was five. one summer of, of laser focus. That's badass. Um, so that that's what I did, and then I, I came back to Chicago and began to embark upon my career based on those five principles mm -hmm. that I you know previously mentioned. So uh, yeah, it took a while to get going, but I you know I was 19. Mm -hmm. Where am I going to go? Right. It's just patience. And, and persistence and, and putting yourself in the pathway of opportunity mm -hmm. that led to me, um, you know, by the time I was 20, by the time I was 22, I was, that's when I was starting to get called for real sessions there. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the time, that, that picked up to where I was doing, you know, anywhere from, you know, 10 to 35 sessions a month. I'm like, why the hell would I want to move to New York or L.A.? You know, this is, this is amazing. You're in good shape at your home. Yeah, I'm home and I'm, I'm free to do different gigs and stuff mm -hmm. at, at night. 
Uh, and you know, I was young. I was making dough, and this was this was good it life. Was, yeah, very, <laughs> very exciting times. Yeah. I mean, you know, you're only a 21, 22 once, um, and have things starting to fall into place for you. But and that's really what led to the, the the whole sticks thing was from the session world that I was in. Right. Cool. Well, you're um, you're speaking, or you've spoken about uh, your time at Berkeley, and you know, a lot of the names that you're throwing out are to me a lot of pretty heavy jazz names. Granted, obviously they do a lot of other things. But um, I guess, you know, part of what I wanted to, you to speak about, which you kind of joked about in maybe a 15-minute interview because you've only played <laughs> one jazz gig and who knows when. It's been a long time. But it's obvious to me, like I said when we were uh, back and forth, um, there are certain things that you're doing, just approaches and styles. It, clearly, you spent time in a jazz idiom, in a jazz language, or at least that's how it appears to me. I mean, because I grew up with a, a, a big band drumming father, and that was the first thing, the first beat that I ever played was ding, ta ding, ta ding, ta ding. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's that's definitely in my DNA. Uh, I, I do I do love jazz, but my my life took more of a rock turn. Which is great, you know. And excuse me, you know, during that time in Chicago when I was doing the sessions, I was playing. That's when I was doing some jazz gigs. I was in a 13-piece uh, uh, Latin samba salsa band. You know, I was in a couple of different rock band projects. You know, trying to get a record deal back then, and yeah. um, you know, doing that whole thing. And you know, playing sidemen and playing with uh, you know corporate party bands and weddings with like you know kick-ass bands with kick-ass right. musicians. Um, so that was great. It was just all these different things, and it kind of felt like Berkeley in a way, where like it's all these different stuff. Do you do a different session? Uh, they want a Nirvana type of thing. It's Pepsi, and then the next session you do uh, is going to be, um, you know, they're going to have Randy Newman singing "You Got a Friend in Me" for McDonald's, and I'm playing with a full orchestra playing. You know, it That's was like cool. it was exciting. I never knew what tomorrow was going to bring. Right. Um, and that was. I mean, I, I wish that that life were still continuing. When I talk about those session days, I feel like a, uh, like a like a ball player talking about back when I played pro ball. Yeah. Um, it's a different animal now. It is. And I, I never got to get into that jingle scenario, but I've heard enough stories, enough people talk about it. It's just a much different time now for that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all, it's kind of kind of gone. gone. I mean, it's still there, but the, the landscape and the, 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 the business paradigm, the creative paradigm is entirely Entirely different, and there used to be demos where you, you know there'd be you know five six thousand dollar budget to get a rhythm section or a horn player in a room and a writer that would write something, and then you got to read it down and make it sculpt it mm -hmm. within anywhere from twenty minutes to an hour. You know you didn't want to be the reason why this was okay. Come on, pressure you didn't want to get it done. Yeah, I mean, if you could read the stuff down and, and, and make it feel good. Yeah, and it's, sometimes you, you you'd show up and you'd start five minutes before the actual call time, you know, like a 9 a.m. jingle time, mm -hmm. and it's like you're ever set up 8.55, and you play through their piece, and the guy goes, all right, that's it. They're like, this, it's, it's, it's 8.57. We're gonna, wow. <laughs> the session doesn't begin for three minutes. Like, that shit would happen. Wow. You know? um, yeah, 60 huh. second piece of music, man, it's a jingle, you know. You're not, yeah. you're not, it's not a 15 minute uh, prog rock opus. <laughs> that's awesome, okay. Um, let's see. So, your primary instrument is the drum set. So yeah. what else are you playing, if anything? Are there any other instruments that you just think, yeah, you know, I thought I'd pick up an alto today. And no, I, I, um, my one regret in life is that my, my parents tried to get me to take piano lessons, which I took, I think, one or two, and then I, I threw a tantrum that I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to play the drums. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone had explained to me that the money's in the publishing, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, you know, I wish that, you know, I tinkered with piano for a bit in, in, in high school, um, and I don't really play anything else. My, my time has always been on, on the drums, mm -hmm. or writing or collaborating in a, um, in a sort of different way with, with other musicians, by like, no, not that, like singing something and then they do, yes, that, you know. Uh, that, that's how I tend to write with others. Um, but, you know, I, yeah, I wish I could sit down and go, like, hey, maybe I wrote this for you. you know, I can't really do that on these, like, <laughs> hey, you know, yeah, start, uh, start 
started getting very esoteric on the symbols. Of this. I wrote this for you, baby. <laughs> I like that. Um, let's see. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it. What profession would you like to attempt other than your own? Or, I like. Or is I, it? I like. I like cooking. Yeah. Yeah. I don't do it enough, and I'm not home enough to get into the groove. But mm -hmm. the little pockets where I'm like pulling out a recipe Dang. and I get you know, going out, getting all the ingredients, and you know, it's it's almost like when when you're like you're working on a song, mm -hmm. you're working on a mix or something like that. There's something. There's a similar thing. Is it, is it done? Is this good? Is this good? You know, <laughs> is, this <laughs> right? is, this, is this just enough? You know, so do I need just a little bit more paprika or whatever? I, I, I enjoy that. And I also enjoy like comfort foods. Um, there's something about, sorry, I'm doing my eye here. Right. Well, cut this out, right? Yeah, um, I got a key. Yeah, well, they, no, 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 we'll cut it out there. No, okay. I'll cut out my eye. <laughs> um, yeah, Chicago hot dogs. Like, there's, there's part of me that always like, kind of fantasizes about it. It's certainly not a get rich quick scheme. But like, there's something about the Chicago hot dog getting all the ingredients right, and like, you know, like quality mustard. Like, quality, you know, you can buy crappy mustard, you can get crappy buns. Like, but to get the right stuff. Um, so where do you go locally for that? Uh, well, there, Windy City has a um, has a, a food truck on 620. That they're they're pretty close. Okay. Um, but there's certain things like you can kind of go deep in it. I'm not going to pretend to be really versed yeah, in Chicago it, dog, but I'm going to go check it out. No, nah, and there, there was a friend of mine, Doug Stone, who had a place called Hot Dogs in Chicago that was legendary. But he was also like a master culinary chef, and he not only made the quintessential Chicago hot dog, but also had um, like you know, foie gras dogs, and like you know, alligator sausage, and all these jackalope with you know, boysenberry uh, brie, oh, and like lovely, just, like, mm. like yeah, uh, a hot cuisine. Um, stuff at his place. But also, you wanted a Chicago dog, did get better than that. Nice. Dig it. Cool. Um, I'm getting hungry now. Yeah, me three. <laughs> um, so, anything going on in music and life in general, just for people um, that you would like to speak about? That's, I know that's incredibly broad, but Boy, that's you, were so, broad. you were so good about just um, wrapping things up in, in the master class and kind of bringing it all together and um, just a really good job of sharing the, the community aspect of what we do. Well, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you're enthusiastic about something, whether it's drums or painting or cooking or whatever it is that you've fallen in love with, you know, the, the word enthusiasm comes from the Greek entheos, which means the God within, which tells me that's the universe's way of, of saying, you're right, you're right to spend your time doing this, and you're on the right track to, to, to want to be involved with what you're doing. Um, so, you know, I, I like to encourage that in, in others, um, because they, they might wonder, should I do this? Do I need to do this? Do I... Should I be spending my time doing something else? And it's like, no, if you, if you have fallen in love with this, embrace that, no matter what it is. Embrace, embrace that, and then make that a big part of who you are on this planet, because life's too short uh, and too fleeting to, to wonder, what do I like and what do I want to do with my time here? You got one life, and we die at the end of this. And so I don't want to waste too much time. I, you know, like the human body needs to relax, and I like to take lie down and take a nap as much as the next guy, mm -hmm. but I also understand that, you know, tomorrow is guaranteed for no one, and I, I, I want to, if not leave as much uh, behind, um, even if it's how I made somebody feel or how I interacted mm -hmm. with, with someone. That's all that we leave behind. That's all we can do is, um, you know, c case in point, like, there's, there's a famous drummer who was uh, just a giant dick to me when I was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And that feeling never went away. Mm -hmm. And when he died, you know, there's an outpouring of like, he was like a father to me. I'll, uh, I will miss his jokes and he would call and all the encouragement. And I'm like, boy, did I not you have that the pleasure. That. that didn't happen. Did I not mm -hmm. have the pleasure? 
And then I remember the guys who were wonderful to me, that were, you know, that at least took a second, looked me in the eye, and I said, hey, what's your name? You know, you know like, hey, I loved your, thank you very yeah. much. Like, I remember that, and that feeling doesn't go away. So the one thing I learned from the guy who was a dick to me was like, I never want to make anybody feel like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially a kid. Yeah. Because that feeling never goes away. Nope. So I, I thank him for, for that great lesson. Uh, but you know, at the end of the, at the end of my life, I'm going to be gone. And if someone goes, I met him once, and he was a lovely guy. That's all we can do. That's all we can leave behind. And then you know, maybe some recorded stuff where someone goes, I really liked his drumming, or that meant something to me, or that moved me, or I danced to it, or something. You know, that's that's all we can do is, is leave behind. Uh, something good. And when I hear negative stories about guys or negative stories about, you know, like certain drummers, it's like, oh, God. It takes more energy to be an asshole than it, than it, than it does yeah. just to smile and say thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. It's wonderful. Man, thank you so much, Todd. Yeah. I appreciate the time. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, Todd Zuckerman. Thanks for watching. Hey, Thanks for having me, man. Yes, sir. Cheers. That's it. Right on.